Welcome back. I'm so glad that you've joined us. We are on the fifth week of our study through the, the, the Great Controversy. That's the title of the quarterly here. And it deals not just with the biblical topic of the Great Controversy, but actually going, not exactly chapter by chapter, but going through the book written by Ellen White over a hundred years ago called The Great Controversy. And this week, lesson number five, we are on the lesson titled Faith Against All Odds. And as we go through this lesson, if you are interested in receiving the notes of each of the panelists as we, as we present them to you, then send us an email at SSP, just three letters there, SSP at 3ABN.org. Now, before we get into the lesson, I will introduce to you who we have speaking with us today. Next to me on my left is Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Daniel. I have Monday's lesson, which is entitled Passing on God's Word. All right. And then we have Jill with Monday's lesson. Thank you, Daniel. On Monday, Tuesdays. we look at Entitled by the Spirit. Tuesday's lesson, my mistake. And then we have John Lomake. Yes, mine is Christ alone, graced alone. Mm -hmm. And then finally on Thursday, the second John, <laughs> Pastor John Dinsey. Thank you. It's a blessing to be here. Thursday, obedience, the fruit of faith is what we will be covering. And I look forward to going all the way through each of these five days with you. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Pastor Dinsey, would you pray for us? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our wonderful and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, because you have given us the great privilege to have a copy of the Holy Scriptures. Amen. We ask you, Lord, to help us to study, to seek to understand, to ask for the blessing of your Holy Spirit we thank you for this opportunity to share with your children all around the world this valuable lesson. We pray that your Holy Spirit will use us and we pray that your name will be honored and glorified in Jesus' holy and blessed name. Amen. Amen. We're on Sunday's lesson and Sabbaths and Sundays together. I'm Daniel Perrin with uh, Faith Against All Odds, Sunday's lesson, God's Word Alone. Now, I grew up going to Sabbath school classes, and when they gave us a memory verse, it meant that that was a verse that we were supposed to memorize. So let's see if we can do that with this one here, Psalm 119, verse 11. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Can we remember that? By God's grace and with his strength, we can. Now let's look at this here. Sabbath's lesson makes two important points. And the first one is that we need to have something to live for. I'm going to start there. But then the second point on Sabbath's lesson is that the battle made public in the Reformation is not yet over. And we'll end with that point today. Of all the theological issues addressed in the Protestant Reformation, and there were quite a few of them, indulgences and who has the authority to, uh, to over the church and salvation by faith and, and confession and free will, this is the one that was the most important. It's this, who can have access to the Bible? There were disagreements, quite a few disagreements among the Protestant reformers, but this they agreed on right here. Who can have access to the Bible? Because if the common man can have access to reading the Bible, the Reformation is just going to take care of itself. Amen. They'll look into the Bible, they'll see the truth there, and they'll say, well, then this is what I ought to do and what I ought to follow. And this is why a great number of the reformers were not only preachers, they became Bible translators and we as well as literacy advocates. Can you imagine translating or even writing out the entire Bible word for word, literally all these pages, writing them out in your own hand, word for word? Would you begin to take possession and ownership of those words? I, about, I, I doubt very many people in this modern era have done something like that. But the reformers, they valued the scriptures literally in the way that King David did. And I want to share with you just one of the verses. There are three texts in the lesson that are highlighted from Psalm 119. I'm just going to pick one of them and ask yourself, can you honestly say the same thing as this verse? And take the whole Psalm 119 and try that. Psalm 119, 147 and 148. I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. My eyes are awake through the night watches that I might meditate on your word. 
Do you do that? Do we value the word of God? Now, the established church in the time of the Dark Ages did something the complete opposite of this. Speaking on behalf of the organized church, Thomas Arundel, Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote this in 1407. We therefore legislate and ordain that nobody shall from this day forth translate any text of the Holy Scripture on his own authority into the English or any other language, whether in the form of a book, pamphlet, or tract, and that any such book, pamphlet, or tract, whether composed recently or in the time of John Wycliffe or in the future, shall not be read in part or in whole, in public or in private. Is that pretty clear right there? Imagine what your world would be like right now if you did not have access to any of the world, word of God. We don't live, I, I personally, I don't speak on behalf of everybody in the world because there are those who do, but I don't personally live in a time where my access to the Bible is restricted. In fact, quite the opposite. The enemy has gone to the other extreme, flooding our libraries and inboxes and phones and ears and minds with all sorts of other religious things, religious information. We'll come back to that in just a few minutes. I want to do something a little bit different here in this lesson. This lesson goes through chapters 7 to 11 of the Great Controversy. So I'm going to give you a little piece of each of those chapters right here. Chapter 7 of the Great Controversy entitled Luther's Separation from Rome, reading from page 125, paragraph 2. Luther had taken a solemn vow to study carefully and to preach with fidelity the word of God. There it is right there. Not the sayings and doctrines of the popes all the days of his life. He was no longer the mere monk or professor, but the authorized herald of the Bible. He firmly declared that Christians should receive no other doctrines than those which rest on the authority of the sacred scriptures. These words struck at the very foundation of papal supremacy. They contained the vital principle of the Reformation. Chapter 8 of the Great Controversy, Luther Before the Diet, page 160, paragraph 2. And this is his response to being asked, do you recant any of these writings or all of them? Unless, therefore, I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture or by the clearest reasoning, unless I am persuaded by means of the passages I have quoted, and unless they thus render my conscience bound by the word of God, I cannot and will not retract, for it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. Conscience bound by the word of God. Moving to chapter 9 of the Great Controversy, titled The Swift's Reformer. That's Ulrich Zwingli, page 173, paragraph 2. The more Zwingli searched the scriptures, the clearer appeared the contrast between their truths and the heresies of Rome. you finding this theme working itself out here. He submitted himself to the Bible as the word of God, the only sufficient invaluable, infallible rule. He saw that it must be its own interpreter. What does this mean? It means you read a text in the Bible and you use the other texts of the Bible to help you understand it. This is not just sola scriptura. This is tota scriptura, the entire word of God. Keep on reading here. He dared not attempt to explain scripture to sustain a preconceived theory or doctrine, but held it his duty to learn what is its direct and obvious teaching. He sought to avail himself of every help to obtain a full and correct understanding of its meaning. And he invoked the aid of the Holy Spirit, important point there, which would, he declared, reveal it to all who sought it in sincerity and with prayer. Everybody who seeks the Spirit will be taught of the Spirit. Chapter 10, Progress of Reform in Germany, page 194, paragraph 1. All who could read. In other words, this wasn't just a, a, a philosophical academic reformation of a few big names. This is anybody who came to the Bible. Were eager to study the word of God for themselves. They carried it about with them and read and reread and could not be satisfied until they had committed large portions to memory. Page 195, paragraph 2, then, persons of all ranks were to be seen with the Bibles in their, Bible in their hands, defending the doctrines of the Reformation. Luther had persuaded his followers to put no faith in any other oracle than the Holy Scriptures. And finally, chapter 11 here, 
Protest of the Princes is the title, page 204, paragraph 2. There is a need of a return to the great Protestant principle, the Bible and the Bible only as the rule of faith and duty. Satan is still working through every means which he can control to destroy religious liberty. The same unswerving adherence to the word of God manifested at the crisis of the Reformation is the only hope of reform today. These, these statements in these chapters give us this principle, God's word alone. You should go read those chapters for yourself. I've given you just some excerpts here. By the way, read your Bible first, read it along with it, look up those texts that are, that are explained there in the book, The Great Controversy, but you can't have a faith that is resting on the excerpts that are given to you secondhand. Read it to yourself. It's good to become familiar or listen to it. It's, it's available on audio. Uh, good to become fami familiar with the history of the, of the Protestant Reformation. Names like John Wycliffe, Miles Coverdale, Erasmus, William Tyndale, John Rogers, the Geneva Bible. Why did they stake their lives on this? The Reformation's not over though. How important is the word of God to you today? Because there is still a shroud of confusion for many people that lays over the word of God. They have it on their shelves, they have it in their language, but they still either don't read it or they don't understand it. So I have a challenge for you. Uh, the lesson says this, the reformers saturated their minds with scripture. What does it mean to saturate? It means to fill it up until nothing else can be added. We have no excuse for not doing this because we have the word of God so available. So individuals, that's you, start a reading plan. Start it today if you haven't. We cannot say we love the Bible if we don't love to read the Bible. Use a real Bible. Sixth volume of the testimonies, page 393 says, the Bible is God's voice speaking to us just as surely as we could hear it with our own ears. Get a reading plan. A verse a day on your phone is not sufficient. I'm going to give you something Martin Luther said here. He said, I study my Bible the way I gather apples. First, I shake the whole tree that the ripest may fall. Then I shake each limb. That's the books of the Bible. And when I've shaken each limb, I shake each branch. That's the paragraphs. And then every twig. And then I look under every leaf. Don't just snack on the Bible. Eat a meal. Pastors, preach from the Bible in simple, easy to understand, clear words. Fathers and mothers, read small portions of the Bible every day to your children. Child Guidance, page 41. The Bible should be the child's first textbook. From this book, parents are to give wise instruction. The word of God is to be made the rule of life. And then teachers, if you are legally allowed, use the Bible in every class, not as your only book, but as the best of all books. The Protestant reformers cared about education and they encouraged people to use the Bible in their teaching. If any of those applies to you, and even if they don't, use the Bible, God's word in your life today. Amen, amen. Thank you, Daniel. I've got Monday's lesson. My name is James Rafferty, and we are talking about passing on God's word. Daniel, you got a great job there passing on the word. Second Corinthians chapter four, we're going to look here at verses one through six, and Paul's declaration in his experience in the word of God. Therefore, he says, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not working in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. Verse five, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Verse six, for God who commended the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What do these passages tell us? The lesson for today says, what do they tell us about the confidence Paul had despite the challenges he faced in proclaiming the truth of God's word? The apostle Paul faced overwhelming odds in his work of spreading the gospel, yet he had the confidence that God's word would eventually triumph for 
as he said, we can do nothing against the truth, mm -hmm. but for the truth. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 8. You know, the reformers, Danny was talking about the reformers, they faced similar trials as mm -hmm. Paul faced. Yet, by faith, the quarterly goes on to say, they remain faithful to God's word. An example of courage in the face of seemingly overwhelming odds is William Tyndale. Yeah. Tyndale's greatest desire was to give England an accurate, readable translation of the Bible. And today we might think, what? We got Bibles everywhere. But as Daniel was sharing, back in the day, Bibles were not available. And even if they were available, very few people were allowed to read them, to gather the apples under those leaves, so to speak. So he had a desire to get the Bible available to the people. He determined to translate the Bible from the original languages and correct some of the errors in Wycliffe's translation 200 years before. Now, eventually Tyndale, too, was arrested. He was tried. Many of these Bible translations which were printed in Worms, Germany, were seized and publicly burned. His trial took place in Belgium in A.D. 1536, and he was condemned on the charge of heresy and sentenced to be burned. His executioners strangled him while they tied him to the stake and then burned his body. And his dying words, the words and thoughts on his brain as he died, were spoken with zeal and a loud voice, Lord! Open the king of England's eyes. Mm -hmm. And God miraculously answered Tyndale's prayer. Mm -hmm. Within four years of his death, four English translations of the Bible were published. In the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, uh, the, the, king, the 1611 King James Version of the Bible was printed and it was largely based on Tyndale's work. The 54 scholars who produced the work drew heavily from Tyndale's earlier English translations. One estimate suggests that the Old Testament of the 1611 King James Bible is 76% Tyndale's translation and the New Testament is 83% oh, wow. of Tyndale's translation. In 2011, the King James Version of the Bible celebrated its 400th anniversary mm -hmm. and it's passing uh, this milestone of printing 1 billion copies. Wow. And this Bible has been translated into over 2,400 languages. And it has impacted tens of millions of people around the globe, including yours truly, me. I love the King James Version of the Bible. So William Tyndale's sacrifice was well worth it. God used his dying prayer and fulfilled it in a miraculous way to give us the Bible that we have to this day. You know, no matter how difficult the quarterly goes on to say it seems or how challenging the circumstances were, Tyndale and his Bible-believing colleagues trusted God. They knew that God would work everything out according to his will. And so Tyndale's life made a difference for eternity. Now today we face a different but just a significant challenge when it comes to Bible versions. The problem today is not that we do not have the Bible, but rather that we have so many different versions of the Bible. I don't know if you've noticed that, but the Bible is the best selling book in the world of all time. Five to seven billion copies is estimated. We really can't figure out. We really don't know how many books of the Bible, copies of the Bible have been printed. Uh, so now we have publishers and people working out ways to bring their theological bents into the Bible and make money on God's Word because it's a best-selling book. People want it. They know it's going to sell. And so they translate the Bible, but each version, each new version, has to be copyrighted in order to make money. And in order for the version to be copyrighted, it has to be up to 20% different from any previous version. Do you get the picture there? Mm -hmm. So you've got all these Bibles coming on. We've got over 100 now. You've got the uncle's Bible and the hiker's Bible and the kid's Bible and the nephew's Bible and the pet lover's Bible and all these different translations of the Bible to make money that are veering away from the original text and the original meaning of the Bible. At this time, there are over 100 translations of the Bible. Each changes to some degree the original text of the Bible, each one of them violating to some degree the words that we find here in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from those things which are written in this book. 
This is talking about changing the meaning of God's Word. It's talking specifically of Revelation, but Revelation is a summation of the entire Bible. In the book of Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. I want to give you an example, a perfect example of a major change that has been made in the book of Revelation to a text in no less than eight translations that has impacted the way we understand or interpret biblical truth, specifically the commandments of God. It's Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. The King James reads this way, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard uh, behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now, this verse is speaking specifically about the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, because in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, we're told that the Lord's day is the seventh day Sabbath. The seventh day Sabbath is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And Jesus Christ affirms that in the New Testament book of Mark chapter 2, when he says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, and I am the Lord of the Sabbath. So we understand this verse to be speaking about the seventh day Sabbath, but I want to share with you a couple of texts, newer translations of the Bible, for example, the Message Bible, very popular Bible. I actually used that to preach for a while until I discovered this verse was there. Now it's on my heresy self. This version of the Bible says, it was Sunday and I was in the Spirit praying, the Message Bible. Or how about modern version number two? This is the expanded Bible. This is a modified version of the New Century uh, Bible, and it was one of the first gender neutral Bibles, which is a whole different topic we're not going to talk about right now. On the Lord's Day, with a reference for a marginal reference here, a footnote, probably a reference to the first day of the week, Sunday, when Christians met for worship, I was in the Spirit. Or how about this modern version, number three? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, footnote, and you go down to the footnote, Sunday is the Lord's Day, or modern version number four. By the way, that last one was taken from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Interesting, the person who authored that was, the, uh, was intending to use the same manuscripts that we use for the King James, the Textus Receptus, but he passed away and the people that took it over switched to the Westcott Hort, the, the Alexandrian text. And then you get to modern version number four. This is the voice. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day brackets, the first day of the week, and I heard behind me, etc. There are uh, other translations, ones in Spanish, uh, Pastor John. We also have uh, translations in Swedish and also in Danish. And there's one in, he in Hebrew, but I haven't been able to find that one yet, but someone has told me about that. So we need to know that Bible versions, many of these Bible versions, these modern versions, and by the way, they're all post-2000, so they've all been printed after the year 2000, are not really based on the Greek, right? Uh, the newer translations are taking us in a direction that allows for a compromise of God's Word and specifically for a compromise of what we understand to be the very center of the great controversy, the worship of God. And this center is going to become a major issue according to Revelation chapter 13 in these last days. So you have Bible verses that are going to back up a counterfeit or an attack against the day of worship that God has set in His Word. So it's very important for us to be in the Word and to make sure that Word is the authentic Word of God. Thank you, Pastor James. Important information. We're going to take a quick break. We've gotten a good start and we'll be right back in a moment. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the 3 ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3 ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back. We're moving now to Tuesday's lesson. Thank you so much, Daniel and Pastor James. What a great study. The authority of the Word of God and the importance of the translation of the Word that we look at as well. I'm Jill Morricone. On Tuesday, we look at Enlightened by the Spirit. You know, when you communicate, whether it's communication with coworkers or I want to use the example of communication in marriage, it takes two people, does it not? One person needs to clearly share 
and they share from the heart. The other person, what do they need to do? They need to listen with understanding. So I think of that as our relationship with God. He wants to communicate with us. He communicates to us through his word. Now, yeah. other avenues as well, I know that, but primarily through his word. The Holy Spirit inspired the word. But you and I need to understand clearly what he's trying to convey to us. We can read the word without the interpretation of the Holy Spirit, without the help of the Holy Spirit, and it might fall flat. It might, we might not understand what God is seeking to tell us. So that's what we look at in my day on Tuesday's day, as we talk about enlightened by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspired the word, that's God communicating to us, but the Holy Spirit fills our minds so that we can understand what God is trying to communicate to us. And at the end, we're gonna look at six keys to approaching the study of the word. But before we do that, here's a couple of scriptures. Second Peter, second Peter chapter one, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We know the word of God was not authored by men. It was literally, but they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Second Timothy 3 says the same thing. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 7, all scripture, that word in Greek, pas, means each and every one. All scripture, not just scripture totality, each and every scripture is given by inspiration of God. Mm -hmm. And it's, thank you, Second Timothy, I'm sorry, Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Each and every scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, King James says, or complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Right. But yet the Lord gives us the Holy Spirit so that you and I can understand the Word of God. So the Word of God was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but we need the Holy Spirit even to understand the Word. Mm -hmm. John 14, this is Jesus talking to his disciples before, right before the night of the crucifixion there, the night before. John 14, 25 and 26. These things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things mm -hmm. and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. In other words, the Holy Spirit teaches us. When we open up the word, the Holy Spirit guides us. The Reformation was founded on an understanding, a proper understanding of the word of God, was it not? The Holy Scriptures were brought to light and the reformers read them eagerly and the Holy Spirit illuminated their minds as they read the scriptures. I wanna read you a quote. This is referring to Martin Luther. This is Great Controversy, page 122. One day, while examining the books in the library of the university, Luther discovered a Latin Bible, hmm. such a book he had never before seen. He was ignorant even of its existence. He had heard portions of the gospel and the epistles, which were read to the people at public worship, and he supposed these were the entire Bible. Now, for the first time, he looked upon the whole of God's word. With mingled awe and wonder, he turned the sacred pages. With quickened pulse and throbbing heart, he read for himself the words of life, pausing now and then to exclaim, Oh, that God would give me such a book for myself. Hmm. You know, it's amazing to me when you think of the reformers because the Roman church had oppressed the word of God. They exalted tradition over the authority of scripture and they would not even allow people to read the word or to see the word, especially in their own language. And you see Luther's joy at discovering oh, the word of God. You know what that tells me? I want a stronger joy in the word. Right. I want a stronger desire to study the word. I want it to be my meat and my drink that I desire earnestly to read and study the word of God. Like Luther did, oh, if I could have such a book for myself. And how many Bibles do you have at home? 
how many Bibles sit on the shelf? And we just say, okay, that's another Bible instead of, oh, I have a Bible that I can use. Praise the Lord. So how do we approach the study of the Word of God? This is not comprehensive on how to study the Word, but just how should you approach even the beginning study? Number one, pray before you study. The Word of God has power to heal hearts, to change minds, to cut out sin. It is powerful and it needs to be handled rightly. It needs prayer. James 1 verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. So just ask God when you approach any time when you open up the word, pray. Number two, what should you pray for? Ask for the Holy Spirit to guide your study. John 16, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, this is Jesus speaking, he will guide you into all truth. So in other words, it's the Holy Spirit. He's the one who helps us understand the word. He's the one who helps us understand scripture. He's also the one, incidentally, in Romans chapter 8, who in helps our prayers come up before the Father. He makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Number three, trust the word. Okay. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God, it stands forever. You know, sometimes when we approach the word, we might almost think, well, it's a good book. Mm -mm. It's the Holy Spirit inspired word of God. You can trust what you read in the word. You don't have to say, well, I don't really like this part or I don't think this part, I don't agree with this part or this part. No, trust the word. Number four, be willing to accept what the word says. James 1 verse 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. In other words, don't just read the word and then you say, okay, that sounds nice. And Pastor James, he can apply that to his life. I don't really need that in my life. No, when you read the word, apply it to your own life and be willing to walk in obedience to what the Holy Spirit shows you is in the word. Sometimes we need to change our lifestyle. Sometimes we need to change our habits. Sometimes the word through the power of the Holy Spirit, reveals an addiction in our life or maybe a hurtful habit. Sometimes we have a twisted understanding of doctrine and we might our whole life have believed that Sunday was Sabbath and Sunday was sacred. And the Holy Spirit's revealing to you even now, oh, it's the seventh day of the week that God sanctified and set apart and made holy. Whatever doctrine, the reformers specifically discovered righteousness by faith, salvation by grace through faith, not through penance and not through more works. It was salvation by grace through faith. So and be willing to accept what the word says. Number five, be diligent in your study. Don't give up. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know what that says to me? Study when it's hard. Mm -hmm. Study when you're confused. Study when you don't feel like it. I don't always feel like studying the Word. Some mornings you wake up and it's your time with God and you think, I'm not sure I want to do that today. No, study when you don't feel like it. Study when it's even a difficult passage and you say, I'm not sure I'm understanding. Study anyway. Finally, key number six, compare scripture with scripture. Mm -hmm. If the Word seems confusing, compare one scripture with another. Isaiah 28 verse 10. Precept must be upon precept, precept right. upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Mm -hmm. It's so important that we study the word in context and we study um, the different passages and compare those different passages together to see what God is truly telling us through his word. Mm -hmm. So it's so important, God wants to speak to us, yes but we need to seek the Holy Spirit's help so that we can truly be enlightened through His Spirit and understand what His Word is trying to tell us. Amen, thank you, Jill, thank you, James. Thank you, Daniel. Mine is Christ alone and grace alone. You know, the Protestant Reformation brought into existence what we might refer to as the five uh, definitions for how 
the approach to studying scripture is most effective. One, the first one is sola scriptura, scripture alone. Then solus Christus, Christ alone. Then sola fide, faith alone. Then sola gratia, grace alone. Then soli dio gloria, gloria, uh, glory to God alone. If you could say that in Spanish, it'll sound a lot better. <laughs> sola scriptura. There you go. And so you find today our lesson is about Christ alone, grace alone, solus Christus and sola gratia, Christ alone and grace alone. This is so vitally important because we live in a world where we train horses, we train dogs, we train birds. We are a, a society that believes that we can buy a horse that has never been ridden before and train it to be friendly to the person that purchased it. We can buy a dog that was just a nice, innocent pup and train that dog to be able to detect disease and to detect narcotics. And that's done training. We could train trees as they're growing to lean in a particular direction or the other. But you cannot train human nature because human nature in and of itself has an issue that must be understood that only Christ alone and grace alone can remedy. Let's look at grace alone. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, yes. and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Many people read that verse and say, well, I don't have to do anything. But I always say, please include Ephesians 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk therein. Justification has nothing to do with your works, but sanctification has everything to do with the works and the faith combined together. You cannot be sanctified because as the Bible talked about Abraham, his works was an affirmation to his faith. Faith without works is dead. But when it comes to the salvation aspects of our walk with Christ, it's Christ alone and grace alone. And why is it so difficult for us to find a way to alter our behavioral patterns? Because there's something about us that's inherently wrong that cannot be trained away. Romans 3 verse 23 tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, how did that happen? Well, let me share a few things with you here. The reason why salvation is through grace in Christ alone is because we inherited something from Adam that predisposes us to be defective. You know, it's like buying a computer right off the shelf and it has a virus in it. And you say, well, I just purchased this thing and it has a virus. Well, we are viruses off the shelf. We have come into the world with difficult hard drives and you try to clean that thing. You try to clean it and prevent hard drives. You get malware preventers. You got things that could detect uh, difficult uh, uh, Trojan horses coming in. We already have a Trojan horse within our character. It's defective. It is default, do wrong, default sin, default think wrong. And all the aspects of our lives are in fact, in a way defaulted to do things that are not in harmony with God's will. So let's look at something that really brought my attention to this because, you know, we talk about behavior modification and today that's a big issue, especially in a, in a generation where people are, and I want to just say this in the context of the, uh, of the, medical, uh, the medical community, people are not so always happy with their gender or people not happy with the way they think. And so the medical community has something called behavioral modification, which they say, if you give us enough time, we can help the work person change the way he or she thinks, even children. Listen to this for an example. Behavioral modification and the medical team is uh, Hannah Scott and um, Mark uh, Coburn. But I'll just share with you what they say. It says behavioral modification is a psychotherapeutic intervention primarily used to eliminate or reduce maladaptive behavior in children or adults. While some therapies focus on changing thought processes that can affect behavior, behavior modification focuses on changing specific behaviors with a little consideration of a person's thoughts or feelings. The progress and outcome of this intervention can be measured and evaluated first a functional analysis of the antecedents and consequences of the problem behavior must be identified. In other words, we've got to find out what's the root cause. And finally, this allows for the determination of specific target behaviors that will become the focus of treatment. And recently, a medical 
uh, medical f procedure was introduced for people that have been addicted all their lives to drugs or to alcohol or to pornography, and they say they, they've noticed that there are certain patterns in the brain that if they input certain electronic impulses, it could, so to speak, reset that portion of the brain, and they no longer have any desire for any of the things that they were addicted to. And they did tests to show guys that were drug abusers, sell drugs all their lives, uh, raised in a family that uses drugs, and all of a sudden, they have no desire for it. Same with alcohol, same with pornography. It's amazing. They modify the brain, but you know what? They did not modify the character. The character is not modifiable. By Christ alone and grace alone, there has to be a change. And why can't the character be modified? Here's the reason why. Because of what we inherited from Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And so who are we? We are the trees. The only way that we can become trees of righteousness is our root system has to change. And here's the default factor. Matthew 7, verse 18, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. So what kind of tree are we? Well, let me let the Bible speak. What kind of fruits do we bear? Let's start with the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and we are so unable to control it. The prophet ends by saying, who can know it? In other words, in the right circumstance, you can't even predict what you're going to do because your nature is so defaulted. Now, what about the days when I do good things? Well, you know, as one writer said, all we are are one set of unrighteous rags compared to another set of unrighteous rags. And we get together and we talk about how somebody else's unrighteous rags are worse than our unrighteous rags. What a futile activity. And what's the problem? Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. That's why when it comes to Christ alone, and grace alone, we enter into the workshop of divinity that can produce something that human modification of behavior can never produce. A change of heart, a change of the root system, and then all of a sudden, the first part of Matthew becomes true. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Why? Because Christ's seed remains in us. And so you might meet people that become Christians and you say, he doesn't curse anymore. He doesn't steal anymore. He doesn't take drugs anymore. He's an honest man. He's not a, a cheater any longer. What happened? His root system or her root system was changed. That's what Christ alone and grace alone can do. But it's not just justification. The reason why Christ is so necessary, he cannot be taken out of the equation because it's not just changing our root system, but bringing us to a place that makes the change a permanent one. Acts 4 and verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for th there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name, not Plato, not Socrates, not the best scientists or psychologists or behavioral modification team. No, no other name. Only Christ can come in and bring within us a power. That's why the Apostle Paul says, Christ in us is the hope of glory. But some people might say, well, you know, if I, I really work on obeying, wouldn't that be sufficient? Well, no. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 says, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. What does that mean? There was a time when the Israelites said, Lord, I know I'm messing up. I'll just go ahead and perform a sacrifice. He said, it'll be a lot easier if you just obey. But they could not because the nature was not under the control of a power outside of themselves. So how do we do it? Do we just grit? How do we do it? Well, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. And here's the key, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Mm -hmm. That cannot be done without Christ in the mix, not just in the mix, but Christ at the center, Christ in control. By his grace, he brings us into the relationship and then Christ alone brings us from justification through sanctification and we can look forward to the day when we are glorified. No presence of sin, no suffering, no sorrow, no crying and thank the Lord, no more defects. And here's how the Bible says, 
Romans 3, verse 24, how is Christ alone being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ alone? Sola Christus and sola fide, Christ alone and grace alone. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Loma Gang. Praise the Lord. Well, we are now on Thursday's portion of the lesson, and the title is Obedience, the Fruit of Faith. I'm reading to you from the lesson. Um, it says, uh, well, it was the year 1517, and a new wind was blowing through the Christian church in the days of Luther. Tens of thousands of people were taught to look away from their sinful selves and to look to Jesus instead. No doubt these people looking to themselves and what they were like themselves saw only things to discourage them. What believer today doesn't want to have the same experience? That's why we need to look instead to Jesus, only Jesus. Mm -hmm. In the lesson, we are instructed to go to Romans 3, 27 to 31, Romans 6, 15 through 18, and Romans 8, 1 and 2. We're going to endeavor to do that. And the question we are looking at is, what do these verses teach us about salvation through Christ's righteousness alone? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Romans 3, 27, beginning there. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. That's right. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there's own, there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? He answers, certainly not. I also say, certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So the law remains. Faith is there, but also the law remains. You cannot take the law away. It's part of the message of salvation. I'm reading to you from a book, Faith and Works by Ellen G. White, page 89. Notice this wonderful message here. From the pulpits of today, the words are uttered, believe, only believe. Have faith in Christ. You have nothing to do with the old law, only trust in Christ. That's what you hear. How different is this from the words of the apostle who declares that faith without works is dead. He says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. James chapter 1, verse 22. We must have that faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Many seek to substitute a superficial faith for uprightness of life and think through this to obtain salvation. Faith and Works, page 89. So we see that we must have a faith that works by love and purifies the soul, being obedient to God through the power that he provides. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing, but with him, all things are possible. I'm going to go to a verse that you just heard, but we need to hear it again. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that you find in the Old Testament scriptures the concept of righteousness by faith. Some people think it's only in the New Testament, but it's there also in the, New, in the Old Testament because God has always had only one way to save human beings, and that is through Jesus Christ, through faith alone, trusting in his righteousness and through his grace. Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. There's nobody going to be in heaven saying, you know why I'm here? It's because I've been a good Christian. It's me. I got myself in here. No, it is only through Jesus Christ. That's right. Isaiah 45, verse 24 and 25, he shall say, Surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. In the Lord all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. To whom do you present yourselves, to whom do you present yourselves to us, uh, to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are uh, slaves to whom you choose to obey. And that's from the book of Romans. 
So in Isaiah 53, verse 11, notice this message. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus Christ took your sins and my sins, and through his sacrifice, you and I can be justified. That's right. We want to also point you to Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. Mm -hmm. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness mm -hmm. as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So we have righteousness in the Lord. He's the one that clothes us with his robe of righteousness. If you think you have righteousness, they are like filthy rags. Mm. And you cannot wash them in anything to make them white. You can put all the Clorox bleach, you can, you can put all the uh, detergents you can find, but your robe of righteousness will be like filthy rags mm. and will always be that way. We need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We go back uh, to that scripture in Romans that I I brought to you before, as Romans chapter 6, verse 15. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Mm -hmm. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So this is obedience from the heart. Remember, a, 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 a heart that works by love, a faith that works by love and purifies the soul. So why do we obey God? Is it because, oh no, I don't think I like being in the lake of fire. It doesn't seem like a pleasant thing to me. So I think I'll be obedient. I think I'll keep those commandments because I don't want to go there. Is that why we choose to be faithful to God? No, that's not the way, that's not the reason why we should obey God. And that's why I bring you to the answer. The answer is we obey God because we love him. A deep appreciation for what he has done for us and continues to do in us should lead us to obey him because we love him. In the book, Desire of Ages, one of my favorite books, page 668, notice what it says. All true obedience comes from the heart. Right. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out, carrying out our own impulses. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a marvelous thing. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Mm. Wow, what a, an experience we can have as we look at Jesus and appreciate what he has done for us. Sin will become hateful to us. Don't you want that experience? Amen. It's available to each and every one of us. And I encourage you to consider what God has done for you. That's why I bring you to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God, I like it the way it says in the King James Version, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you. He died for me. And he today is commending his love toward you. So I encourage you, give him your whole heart. Give him completely your whole heart and you will find that it's the best thing you could possibly do. I end with Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, 
but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. We right. find freedom in Jesus Christ. Remain in Christ. Because if we remain in Christ, there is no condemnation for us. And I praise the Lord that today we have that opportunity. Accept it, take hold of it, and never let it go. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dinsey, for pointing us again to the righteousness of Christ. This has been a good study on the value and power of the Word of God, and we have just a little bit of time for some final comments here before we close. So some people might be asking, how? How do these modern translations come into being? Well, the reason is, is because translations have changed over the years. The King James, for example, is more of a word-for-word -word translation from the Greek and Hebrew. Then you have a thought-for-thought -thought translation like the NIV, which takes a little bit of liberty, but then you move into the modern paraphrases or the dynamic equivalent translations like the message and the voice that we quoted from, and they have full liberty. They don't even have to stick to the Hebrew or to the Greek, and therefore we have translations today that have moved far away from the original manuscripts. I encourage people, have a KJV in your library. Even if you can't understand it as well, it's something you need to have there to compare these modern Bible translations with. Amen. On Tuesday, we look at Enlightened by the Spirit and the importance of seeking the guidance and influence of the Holy Spirit as you study the Word of God. That's right. And when we think about Christ alone and grace alone, the beautiful message of that is in Matthew 121. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. No other method, through Christ alone. Amen, amen. With that, I also say to you, face each day, each challenge, each, te each temptation, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you, Pastor Dinsey, Pastor Loma King, Jill, Pastor Rafferty, each one for your contributions here today. The big idea from this lesson, God's word is valuable. Mm -hmm. Handle it with care. Listen to it with understanding. Be rooted in God's word. Be transformed by God's word and allow God's word to lead you to the righteousness of Christ. How valuable is God's word? Psalm 119, 162 says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. We're not done with the great controversy yet. Come back next week for lesson number six, the two witnesses, and we'll be glad to study with you then again.